Hey, thank you so much for joining us online today. We believe that God wants to use this message to speak directly to you. And so as you listen, we encourage you to have an open mind and an open ear to what God is saying. As well, you can access the sermon notes from this message on our website and on our church app. Well, good morning, Lakeshore family. How are we doing this morning? Good to see you guys here. And hey, you braved the obstacle course of the parking lot. Congratulations. You made it in, you're here. Hey, thanks for your patience with all that. As you can see, progress is taking place, which is exciting, but uh, that'll just be temporary for the next few weeks, and then we'll get a nice open parking lot to come in here with ease. And so thanks for your uh, patience with that. But hey, if I hadn't had a chance to meet you, uh, my name is Nick. I'm one of the pastors on the team here. Honored to bring the word with you today. We are in this series called All In. And so part three of that today. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. We're gonna go to Acts chapter two. Uh, in this series, it's really been a series to complement the season that we're in as a church, which is our small group launch season. So you heard a little bit about that on the announcements. Uh, but we believe this, that some of the best ministry that you could receive in this church may not happen on a Sunday morning. It actually may happen in a group. Some of the greatest relationships, friendships. Uh, we just kicked off our group's season. The tables are still in the lobby. All of our groups are still online. So make sure you check out a group if you haven't found one already and get plugged in. But this series really is uh, all about uh, the church community and the start of the church. And in Acts chapter two, we see the genesis of the church, the beginning of the church. And, and we all know this, that sometimes uh, you can have vision drift and you can see things shift and change. And you've got to go back to the beginning to see the church in its purest form so that we together collectively can say, this is our aim. This is our goal. This is where we're headed. This is what we're trying to do. And so that's what we're going to do uh, this morning. But really the term all in uh, means this. It's, it's like I'm pushing my chips, all my chips to the center of the table. I'm fully committed. I don't have a plan B. This is my plan A. I'm all into this thing. And I believe this, that in the day and age and the culture that we live in, we need some believers who are all in. That we need some people to say, I'm pushing everything to the center of the table. This is my plan A, I'm all into this thing. And I'm talking about believers who have a commitment to God, commitment to his word, commitment to his presence, and a commitment to his church. And so that's what we're gonna talk about uh, this morning. I wanna speak to you on the subject of a commitment to community. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray together before we jump into the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word this morning. God, we thank you for every person in this room watching online. God, those that'll watch it afterwards. God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of us. God, that you would just speak to us at the point of our need. God, where we need to be convicted, convict us. Where we need to be encouraged, encourage us. Where we need to be strengthened, strengthen us. And so God, we thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. A couple weeks ago, I was at a meeting in Richardson, Texas, at a high-rise building on the 14th floor. And it was that morning that I was reminded how awkward elevator experiences can be. Can anybody relate? You're in a four by four, what feels like a four foot by four foot box. If you're claustrophobic, you're struggling already. Random people walk in, the ventilation isn't good, there's awkward music playing in the background. You don't know where to look, you don't know what to do. Uh, sometimes people bring stenches in with them that you wish they would have left on the outside. Ele elevators are just, just, just awkward. We've all, we've all been in a situation, and that guy, we probably if we had a moment of honesty, uh, you've been in a point where you've actually got on an elevator. You thought you had the elevator all to yourself, you see somebody walking down the hall towards the elevator, you throw a friendly wave as you're pushing the close button with the other hand, right? <laughs> You've been there. Okay, thank you, I'm not the only person. Because they can, they can be awkward. We've had this situation where you've waited for an elevator and it finally comes after 18 minutes and the door opens and there's three big guys making a wall in front of the, the door where there's plenty of room you know, behind them but they're just giving you a hint like you're not welcome here, right? Like, We've had that. We've had the experience maybe where we've been in an elevator and we stop on every floor when there's plenty of space and now you find yourself being pushed back into the corner of an elevator where you, you, you're sure you're past the weight limit. Parts of your body are touching parts of their body. It's not comfortable, right? It shouldn't be happening at this moment. You're sweating and the door finally opens. We've, we've, all, we've all been there. 
And here's what I know, an elevator, an elevator has, should have some rules, I believe, written on the inside of the elevator. There's some elevator etiquette. There's these unspoken rules. Rule number one is this, is when you get on an elevator, you don't look anywhere except for the numbers as the floors go down. And, and are you with me, right? Rule number two is this, you don't talk on an elevator. An elevator is not a place to have a conversation. It's not a social club. It's, it's weird enough as it is that I'm stuck in this small space with a person I've never met before. Uh, so let's not talk, all right? And, and an elevator is not a place where you have a social club. An elevator is a place that you get on, you deal with the people around you, you get off, and you go to your destination. Can I get a good amen, right? That's, that's what an elevator is. But I think that what's, what some of us do is we take this elevator mindset and we think it'll work with how we uh, grow spiritually. And we take this mindset and we take it into the church and we say, this is how we do church. That we will we'll take the mindset and we'll say, I'm gonna show up at church, I'm gonna deal with the people around me, I'm gonna deal with the crowds, I'm gonna worship, I'm gonna listen to a message, and then I'm gonna head on to my next destination. And I believe this, that if we take this mindset, this same mindset that is appropriate for elevators, but not great for a church, that we've, we will miss out on some of the best that God has for our life. You see, God never intended the church to be a place that you attend and then you just get to your destination. God, God intended church to be a community that you get planted in so that you can grow in to be all that God created you to be. You see, the, be, the best way to see this is for, you to go, for us to go all the way back to the beginning, to the genesis of the church, as we mentioned in its purest form, you see, and the church was established after the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is happening. There's 120 believers in a place they called the upper room. The Holy Spirit came and, and, and filled all these people with his presence. And then Peter goes outside and he preaches to a large crowd. And then we pick up in Acts chapter two, what happened? And so after Peter preached, it says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So the very first church in the history of the world was a mega church, right? 3,000 people. But it wasn't just a big crowd because every, every number had a name, every name had a story, and every story mattered got to God. These are 3,000 3, people's lives who were changed that day. And the beginning of the church takes place. 3,000 people were saved that day. And these people made a decision to commit their lives to Christ. But what happens after that, I think a lot of times you and I miss or we disregard is that they committed their life to Christ, but what we can see here in Acts chapter two, 42, what did they do after they committed their life to Christ? What did it look like? We see in 42, it says this. So they get saved, the church starts, it says, then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You see, it says they devoted themselves. They got saved and then they devoted themselves. In the Greek, I'm not even trying to explain, like, pronounce that word, devoted means this, to continually give of yourself. You see, they were, they were, they were all in. They went from salvation, I've given my life to Jesus, now I'm, now I'm continually giving of myself to his call on my life. It was a lifestyle of surrender. They were devoted. And here's the reality, is that you, we are all devoted to something. You just, not, you just may not be devoted to the right things. Right, we're all devoted to something. We all give our lives to something continually. So the question is, is what you're devoted to something that really matters? Is it something that's significant? Is it something that has value? You know, we devote ourselves to a lot of things like the latest Netflix show or your hobbies or social media or the Dallas Cowboys who are gonna beat the Jets today and it's gonna be awesome. But we all give ourselves to, to something. We all, continue, we all give ourselves continually to something. The question is, is it something that really matters? You know, yesterday I had the incredible honor of being a part of a homegoing service for a beautiful lady who attended this church. And I get, whether I, every time I go to a funeral, whether I'm a part of it or sitting in the crowd, there's always this sober moment when family and friends get up and share their greatest memories or the things that truly matter or moments of significance that took place in that person's life. And every time I hear them, as, as much as I have the opportunity to go to funerals, being in ministry and just being in that world, it's always a recalibration. It never gets old. 
When you hear people get up and share the things that really matter, the things that last, that when people share when they're in that moment thinking about life and how life is short and just what really matters on this earth, it's the things that we don't usually chase after. They're the, they're the small things, they're the faithfulness, it's the significance, it's the memories that were made, it was the life that was shared. And they don't typically share about these big, great, victorious wins. It's those moments along life that truly matter, that stick, that leave an impact on other people's life. And I always have this, this sobering moment. And it's a recalibration moment for me to ask the questions, am I giving my life to the things that really matter? What am I devoted to? What am I continually giving my life to? See, the people in Acts chapter two Immediately from, they went from a devotion, giving their life to God to a devotion to something else. And I believe this, that if we can get this today, if we can all grasp this concept today, it'll be a game changer for your life. See, many of you here, you've made a commitment to have a relationship with Jesus. You've got a relationship with God. But you miss out on the next commitment. What I believe is you get this, we'll take you to the next level. It's not just a commitment to God, but it's a commitment to God's community. See, in, in Acts chapter two, 43 through 45, it says this, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs as they performed by the apostles. All the believers, they were together. They had everything in common. They sold their property and their possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts together. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying all the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily for those who are being saved. It says they committed themselves, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, this community. This Bible says, they, they, they would say this, this is almost like a brotherhood they committed themselves. They went from a devotion and a commitment to God to a devotion to God's community. You see, this is a picture of the church in its purest form. This is, this is the commitment to the community that we're all called to be a part of, to, to have our aim towards, to be involved with, to help contribute towards. This is what the church should look like. The Lord added to their number daily to those being saved. Every time I read that final statement, I have this like, wow moment, because you don't really hear, or they don't really address people sharing their faith or inviting people to be a part, which I'm sure that happened, but I could just see people looking at this and saying, I wanna be a part of that. Man, that is, that's, they're, they're sitting there on the outside saying, man, these guys care for one another. It's like a spiritual family. They're doing life together. They're breaking bread together. They're not eating kale and salads. They said they brought carbs, right? Like, they broke bread. Give me those carbs, you know? It's biblical. You don't, don't eat spinach, okay? But they broke, they broke bread together. And people on the outside, I could just see saying, I wanna be a part of that. The Lord added to the, those who being saved because healthy things grow. God brought people, he entrusted people to the community of believers because it was healthy. He knew people would be cared for and loved and help healing be brought into their lives and their marriages and their families. The Lord added to their number daily. And I believe this, the local church is the hope of the world and it's God's strategy for community. It's the hope of the world and it's God's strategy for community. God established a church for you to be a part of a family that would live on mission so that you could use your life to make a difference. You know, and there's, I believe this, there's some people where you would just say, well, I don't, I don't need that. It's just me and Jesus. Like I got my Bible at my house in my little prayer closet. It's just me and Jesus, we're good. I don't need all this community stuff. And I would submit to you, if that were true, then what happened in the garden should have been enough. Meaning this, God created Adam and Adam and God should have been enough. But God looked at Adam and he said this, it's not good for man to be alone. That, that God and Adam wasn't enough, that there was a sense that there needed to be community, there needed to be more. And I believe this, that regardless of the level of intimacy that you have with God, you are still called to be a part of God's people. So over the next few minutes, I wanna answer the question, because a lot of times when I hear a talk like this, I, I, I'm, I'm a questioner, I like to ask the question, well, why? why? Why do I need to be committed to a local church? I'm gonna give you three things, and then we'll close out. The first one is this, is that commitment lasts longer in community. Commitment lasts longer in community. Has anybody ever tried to do a diet on your own? <laughs> 
You ever tried to like consistently work out on your own? I'm not talking to like the super disciplined people who do it by yourself every day. I'm talking about people like me, regular people who struggle. When I'm, when I'm by myself, I drift. It's easy for me to, to make excuses. It's easy for me to stop doing things I know I wanna be doing. Uh, a few years ago, a group of us from the staff, we did what was called a challenge, some of you may know, called 75 Hard. Anybody know this challenge? It's pretty much you pick five, there's five disciplines, and you try to do them for 75 days straight. If you miss one day, you start back over at day one. And we got on this little app called Habit Share, and we're keeping track, and we would trash talk people who missed up and make sure they started back. But, but it was the, the sense of the community, the sense of the accountability, the encouragement, the, the days that one person didn't want to try, to, didn't want to do it, we encourage them. And hey, is it really worth it? You're going to start back over at day one, and so they get outside and do their workout outside in the rain and whatever it needs to be done. But, but it's, it's, it's easier to stay committed when we're doing things together. And I believe this is if you want to do this for the long haul, you're going to need people around you that will strengthen you, that will challenge you, and that will encourage you. You see, your commitment will always wane when you're disconnected from community. And that's what the book of Hebrews, why it says it like this in Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another in. And all, as more, all the more as you see the day approaching. And the day approaching he's talking about is when Jesus returns, when all this thing finishes up as we get towards the end. It's saying it's even more important that we spur one another, that we continue to meet together. And I find it interesting in this scripture that they say they're not, they're not, not meeting together because they don't want to or because their intentions are to. They actually just got out of the habit of it. And here's what I know is your good intentions don't shape your life, your habits do. Your habits will, the things you do consistently over time, continually meeting together, that's what the writer of Hebrews is telling us to do. And, and here's, here's what I know is that we've gotta continue. You need people around you to help you because your commitment will be stronger when you are together. And you get connected, when you get disconnected from community, your commitment starts to wane. You stop serving, you stop giving, you stop living on mission because you're disconnected from God's people. Psalm 92 encourages us with this. It says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They'll grow like the cedars of Lebanon. And then it says, as planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. This is such a clear scripture. If you wanna flourish spiritually, you've gotta be planted in the house of God. If you wanna flourish, you've gotta be planted. You and I need to recognize this, that you, your, your life is like a seed that you need to recognize your life is like a seed and just like in every seed, there's unknown potential. There's unknown and untapped potential in every single seed. If you think about what could come out of one seed, all, if you planted a tree, the forests that could take place if that tree were nurtured and cared for and planted in the right places, the exponential growth, the legacy that would take place for generations to come out of one seed. Your life is like a seed. Every seed has a potential to grow, to thrive, to multiply, and to produce fruit. Every seed that's not planted will be dormant, unproductive, unfru unfruitful, and dissatisfied. I could take a seed and throw it down on this stage today, and because it's not cared for, it's not in the right environment, it's not planted, we will never see the potential of that seed. But if I take a seed and plant it in good soil and care for that seed and see that seed reproduces and replant seeds that come from that seed, there's a generational legacy that'll take place if it's planted. And this is the, the illustration the scripture is giving us. That when we plan ourselves, our life is like a seed. And if we plan ourselves in the house of God, it's good soil that'll nurture us, that'll care for us, that make sure that we have a life that leaves a legacy, a spiritual legacy for generations to come. So your life will flourish when you are planted in the house of God. And here's what I believe. I don't, I don't think the enemy cares that you go to church. I don't think he cares. I think he starts to care when you get planted. When you, when, when you, when you get your roots set in a bit. Because just, he, he doesn't care if you just show up and go through the motions. He cares if you get connected to relationships and get encouraged and to get your faith built and sees your marriage healed and sees your kids grow up with a generational legacy of, of God's word as the foundation. He starts to care when, you see, when he sees life change take, take place because someone's encouraging and speaking life into you that you couldn't get unless you were a part of a body of believers or community called the local church. That's when you start to become a threat. That's when he sees things happening and shifting in your life and he, he gets to get a little nervous. 
is when you get planted. See, we wanna see you flourish. That's the heart of Pastor Brad, our pastor. He wants to see you flourish. He wants to see you become a fully devoted follower of Christ. And so how will that happen? It'll only happen when you get planted in the local church. And if not this one, then find one. I, I get it, like there's, church isn't one size fits all. If, it, if, if, we're, if we're not the church for you, our heart would just be that you find one. We wanna see you planted in a church. There are many great churches in this area. If you need to find one, if this is the one for you, I will personally recommend some others. It's not, it's not us about trying to do something here. We just wanna see you planted. We wanna see you grow. We wanna, we wanna help you find your place. We wanna help you find your people. We wanna help you find purpose. And that will never happen if you're not planted in a church. Get connected with the relationships here. Get in a group, jump on a team, go on a mission trip, put yourself out there, meet somebody in the lobby, whatever it takes, go to growth track. We set all these things up, not because we're passionate about programs, we're just, we're passionate about seeing you connected and fulfilling the purposes of God in your life. We say it like this, we're not, we're not passionate about small groups. We're passionate about you finding hope in those small groups. We're not passionate about growth track. We're passionate about you discovering your purpose. And these are just vehicles and ways that we help connect the dots for you to see that you become a fully devoted follower of Christ. We wanna see you planted in the house of God. Make it a priority to building relationships and connecting community in a local church. The second thing is this. We are stronger together. Why do you gotta, com why do you gotta commit to a local church? Because we are stronger together. If you haven't noticed, the world that we live in is brutal. <laughs> it's, it's tough, it's difficult. It's hard to live in the culture we live in as a faith-filled believer. But I can promise you this, uh, that you will face opposition in the near future. You may, say, you may say like, hey, I'm in church, can you be a little more positive? I'm positive you're gonna face some opposition in the future. You'll have a struggle, you'll have a setback. You may interact with a crazy person. If you don't have one, I'll give you a few of mine, okay? Like, you're, you're gonna have some sort of opposition in the future, and if you face opposition alone, you're vulnerable. But if you face opposition with a community, a group of people, they can watch your back, they can watch your side, they can help you up when you fall. You need some people in your life to help bring strength around you. My wife and I went on a uh, trip here recently to Northern California, and we got to see the incredible redwood trees. Has anybody ever seen the trees in person before? I mean, you can look up pictures, but pictures don't do justice. Seeing these trees in person are mind-blowing. They, they, this picture doesn't do justice, but it's just a, an idea. They're massive. They're massive. You've, we've probably all seen the picture where the tree, the car drives through the tree. I looked up some of the details on these trees. Get this. Uh, trees can get, these trees can get up to 375 feet tall. Eight, up to 18 feet wide. Some of these trees are actually 3,000 years old. So before Jesus walked the earth, some of these trees were planted, growing, and living, and still on planet earth today. Mind-blowing. You need to see them in person. They're unbelievable. But here's the crazy, the crazy thing. What's fascinating about these trees is the thing that sets these trees apart that allowed them to last the test of time and to go the long haul is actually due to their root system. But their root system isn't what you think. They don't go extremely deep. Their root system only goes six to 10 feet deep. The thing that makes these strong is that they, since they only go six to 10 feet deep, they actually can go 100 feet wide. And when a tree is planted alone, it can't survive, but most of these trees you'll find are, are in packs and close together. And because their roots will go wide, they intertwine with all the other trees' roots around them. And so that when a storm comes through, what allows them to last the test of time is that they're actually strengthened by being close to one another. And they're the largest, longest living trees on planet Earth, and it's because of their root system they're connected to one another. If you took one of these trees and planted it by itself, it wouldn't last the test of time but the fact that they're connected together and their root system is entangled together, they last. See, it does, this tree doesn't survive because it's strong. It survives because they're strong. And the same is true for us. Let's, if we were to be real, we're not strong. 
We, we focus so much time on trying to make ourselves strong, but when you get real, when you get authentic, when you take the mask off, when you're alone by yourself, looking at who you really are, the, the reality is this is we're all weak, and we've all got weaknesses. But the beauty of the local church is that when we're made, when we are weak, he is made strong because we've got a faith-filled community of believers around us called the local church, living on mission, serving one another, loving one another, caring for one another, because together we are strong. You know, this funeral that I mentioned I did uh, on Friday, a beautiful woman named uh, um, Jennifer Tarter, who attends the church, she died at 53 years of age. And, and I talked to Bill, her husband, on Tuesday as we went over just the details of the funeral. And it was, it was interesting because typically in these meetings you'll talk about, share some memories. Let me learn a little bit more about her story, how she grew up. And every time we'd have this conversation, he kept going back to how much her small group in this church meant to her. And I kept redirecting the conversation nicely like, Bill, tell me a little bit more about your memories with Jennifer and this and that. And he just kept going back to, if it, if it weren't for the, her small group, we wouldn't have got through this. I said, tell, tell me about that. So I finally just went there. I said, tell me how you got connected here. And he said, we used to come on again, off again. We weren't really committed. We'd just come some Sundays here and there. And he said, four years ago, we went to the doctor. And the doctor told us that she was diagnosed with uncurable cancer. And we didn't know what to do. And so we just got on the phone early one morning and we called the church. And we just wanted a pastor to pray with us. And a lady by the name of Marisol Lopez answered the phone that morning. She's one of our, she was working as our missions coordinator at the time. And she said, there's not a pastor here, uh, but can I pray for you? And she prayed for her. And she said, hey, we've got a small group. My husband and I lead a small group at our house. Would you guys like to come? We'd love to have you. And that's how the conversation went. Sure enough, they showed up that night. And I'll make a long story short. They became friends that vacationed together. That whole small group did life together. They were doing everything together, going on vacations and trips. And Bill told me in that morning, he said, there were women in that small group that in the final days of my wife's life, when hospice was in our home, laid in bed with my wife, I couldn't have made it through without my small group. And to me, that just paints a beautiful picture of the strength of the church, is that we care for one another. We serve one another. That the, that, that the, she, that she, the, the stories were told at the funeral that she, is, she was grateful to God in her last days, thanking God for the community of faith that's, that was surrounding her. And that's a picture of a spiritual family, what the church is supposed to be. And I don't, I, if you're not connected, if you're not involved relationally, man, I, I would hate for you to go to a season without receiving that type of care and that type of support and that type of strength because here's the reality. We're strong. Together, you may say, well, I don't have those type of people. The Bible says this, once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. We see in Psalm 68 that God places the lonely in families. I don't know what your past church experiences have been like, but I'll tell you this, you belong here, you are welcome here, you have family here, and there is a community available for you. That you belong, you're part of this family. You may be here and you may say, hey, things are good. This season of life is good and, and, and I don't really need this family and I'm, I don't need any support. Well, I would say this, well, someone here needs you. Like there's something inside of you, God's put you here for a reason and a purpose and there's gifting and purpose inside of you that somebody else is waiting to receive. That we're a family and that's what families do is we give and we serve and when one person's in need, we help the other and we care for and we love and we do life together. This is a picture of the church, there's people here that need you. And we're stronger together. And then last but not least is this. Alone you can do a little, but together we can do a lot. Alone you can do a little, but together we can do a lot. I think about the story of Lakeshore. I know there's some people in this room you've been a part since the beginning, and others you may have just recently uh, joined the family. But it's amazing to me, it's nothing short of a miracle to see God grow this community starting out in Rowlett with a bunch of, about 40 people. Pastor Brad comes on the scene with 40 people and, and struggling with their vision, not knowing what the next step looked like. And as, faith, as we stayed faithful, caring for and loving people, God began to build the church and we moved to downtown in Rockwall and then moved out here to the 50 acres and now we're adding on this facility so that we can care for and love more people. And if you think about the miracle 
of God growing his church. You know, I think about what we're able to accomplish as a church family. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna quickly go through some things that we were able to do just, just this year. You know, this year we are on track to give away over $500,000 to ministries and missionaries outside of this building. Come on. Come on, we, month, monthly we, we serve ministries we serve the pregnancy resource centers where girls can come and choose life and get care and help they need. We, we help the helping hands locally here with their food bank and clothing and helping families who are, who are, who are have going through a tough time and paying for some of the utility bills. We serve Convoy of Hope where they roll into areas that have had catastrophes and tornadoes come through and they bring water and shelter and share the gospel. We partner with Dallas Dream Center and LA Dream Center and New York Dream Center that, that connect with people who are living on the street who maybe are addicted to drugs or have gone through a tough time, they rehabilitate them and disciple them and teach them God's word and get them back out into society. We partner with orphanages overseas. We pl we're planting churches with ARC. We're reaching unreached people groups. We're building water wells in Africa. We're serving widows and orphans here locally and overseas. Come on, we're making a difference as a church. I couldn't do that by myself. You couldn't do that by yourself, but together we can do a lot. And that's the beauty of the local church is that we can do so much together. Let me share something even here locally. Last year, from January to December, the full calendar year, in our church, we saw 469 people make decisions for Christ. Come on, we can celebrate that. Get this, this is exciting. So this year, from January through August, we've seen 513 people give their lives to Christ. And we're not even done the year yet. And you may say, like, like what, is the church all about numbers? Why are you counting numbers? Because you count things that matter. I don't have somewhere between one and five children. I have three of them, okay? <laughs> this, is, this matters. These represent lives and eternity and people that went from death to life. Come on, this is what we're doing together as a church, and not one person did this. See, this church isn't built on the gifts of one, but on the sacrifices and the faithfulness of many. And I believe this, that when we get to heaven, we're gonna be surprised who celebrated. That you don't have to be on a stage, that it's not about the people on the stage, but I believe there's gonna be tons of people that are over in Lakeshore Kids, praying over babies, rocking babies, ministering to your children right now, they're gonna be celebrated in heaven. I believe that the people that are out in the parking lot in the 110 degree weather in Texas sun, waving at you as you come into the parking lot, helping you find a parking spot, they're gonna be celebrated in heaven. The guys back in this room running production on the screen so that you can see you had an experience to, to receive the gospel this morning. They're gonna be celebrated in heaven. Greeters and ushers and everybody. I think sometimes we think our task, what we contribute is insignificant. But here at Lakeshore, we believe that every member is a minister and every task matters and collectively what we're doing together equals this. And we're able to serve people and minister to people. I think about what we're doing with the journey campaign, adding on to this facility, the, the sacrificial giving that's taking places where people are saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some sacrifices so that we can see the gospel continue to move forward in the Ray Hubbard region. It's a miracle. There was, a, there was an organization that came into this church that was doing some filming, and they were from a different country, and uh, actually from over in the Europe area. And they were walking our lobby, I was showing them around, and he said to me, he goes, he was just blown away, he's like, so how does this happen? Does the government give you money? It's like, no, no, the government doesn't give you. I said, this is, this is the church. The people tithe and give and they believe in the mission of what we're doing here so that we can see people reach in our community. It's, it's, a, it's incredible, it's a miracle because together we can do a lot, but alone we can do a little. Every member is a minister. And you may say, well, it looks like you're doing church fine without me. Look, service happens week after week. And I'd say, I'd say, yeah, we're doing it week after week, but we'd be so much better with you. That there's something inside of you that God's placing you for this time and this season to make a contribution to somebody else's life. In the way, in the way you serve, in the way you give, in the giftings and ability you have that would allow us to do even more. I promise you this, we will always have more vision than we will have people or resources that we're gonna to continue to move the vision of this church forward to reach people in this community. I'll close with this. This is a Belgian horse. This is big, the biggest horse on planet Earth. 
alone, this horse can pull 8,000 pounds. It's a pulling horse, 8,000 pounds. And so anybody who's good in math, with math would say, all right, if this horse could pull 8,000 pounds and if we put two of them together, they could pull 16,000 pounds. Am I right, is my math right? But here's the reality, if you put two of these horses together, they found not that they pull 16,000 pounds, these horses can actually pull 32,000 pounds. See, this is the power of community, the power of synergy, the power of unity, the power of us as saying we're collectively working together, we're committed to this, we're all in moving the church forward, moving the kingdom of God forward, making a difference on planet Earth with our life. Here's what they actually found. They did a study on these two horses where they took two of these horses that grew up around the same time and lived together for a long period of time. And not only did they do, could they pull 32,000 pounds, they actually could pull 50,000 pounds because of the longevity of their relationship. The ability they had when working together when they weren't doing it alone. Philippians 2, verse two with that beautiful horse background behind that scripture, (laughs) says this. Then, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. See, our church is strongest when everybody is doing their part. We're pulling our weight together. We're moving the church forward. We're, 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 we're making sure that it's hard for people in the Rockwall, Ray Hubbard region to go to hell because we're unified. We're all in. We're making a difference. We're pursuing Jesus together. Because alone we can do a little, but together we can do a lot. In Acts chapter two, The disciples made a decision, they got saved, they made a commitment to Jesus, and they made a commitment to Christ's community. And so I'll say it like this. Your first yes offers you salvation. Your second yes offers you significance. Would you bow your head with me this morning? I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me in this message today? I wonder what it is that God's asking you to say yes to. You see, in our culture, when we talk about surrender, giving something up to gain something else, we, we typically think that we're losing. In war, when you surrender, you're losing. But in the kingdom of God, when you surrender, you actually win, because you're open-handed. You're saying, God, my life is yours. I wanna make a difference. I wanna make an impact. I wanna be used by you. I want my life to matter. When people share stories about my life at my funeral, I want them to share things that actually matter. I want them to have things to say. God, I wanna be devoted to you. I wanna be devoted to your church. I wanna commit my life like the early church. God, use us, send us, commission us together to make a difference. You know, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you haven't said the first yes yet, I wanna give you that opportunity. It's actually a lot simpler than you probably think. A lot of people say this, you gotta get your life right, you gotta, you gotta get in the right, headed in the right direction, you gotta clean up before you can come to God. That's farthest from the truth. The Bible tells us this, God says, come just as you are. And it's when you make that decision to acknowledge your need for him and you begin your relationship with him that you actually are given the power to make some of the changes that you probably wanna make. And that's a process he'll walk you through, but the first step is this, is beginning a relationship with Jesus. So I'm gonna pray a prayer here in a minute. I'm gonna guide you in that prayer and you just pray something very similar, but you gotta mean it with your heart. And I believe this, God will begin to give you a fresh start, a new beginning, and you'll begin to see your life change. So if that's you this morning, you were to say, I don't have a relationship with God, I need a relationship with God, I need to get things right with God, would you do me a favor, just slip your hand up real quick so I know who I'm praying with. Slip it up, I'm gonna pray with you, acknowledge you, thank you, sir. Anybody else? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, two in the back, thank you. Thank you up here on the front. Thank you, sir. 
Come on, anybody else, I don't wanna let this moment pass. Thank you in the back, in the front row, in the fourth row back here, thank you. Thank you, you can put your hands down. Awesome. Come on, Lakeshore, can we pray together so no one's praying alone? Pray this together, say, dear Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for dying for me. I repent of my sin. I ask you to fill me with your spirit. For the rest of my life, I'll follow you. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Come on, church, can we celebrate with those that made that decision? Come on. Hey, wherever you're watching from, thank you so much for joining us online today. If you made a decision to follow Christ, we would love to send you a brand new Bible and a devotional guide to help you in your new journey of faith. To get these resources or to submit a prayer request, fill out our digital communication card by texting Lakeshore to 94000. We'd love to celebrate what God is doing in your life and help you with your next steps. Thanks again for joining us online. We hope to see you soon.